But we're going to need a bigger cup of tea for this one. Good morning. Do you ever get a PhD in environmental chemistry only to see that the EU is making moves to color code clothes and other consumer goods by sustainability by the end of 2023? Except microplastic shedding, notoriously difficult to recycle polyester, somehow ranks highest, while biodegradable, cradle to cradle friendly natural fibers like wool, hemp, and linen are vying for the lowest ranking? What is that, you say? Not a method that was developed to be a green incentive, yet somehow ended up com being completely at odds with its own goals? And also, incidentally, at odds with my own lifetime dedication of always striving to be a little bit more sustainable. This I had to investigate further. Get strapped in, folks, because we are about to get technical. So. What is the crux of the matter? In 2013, the EU launched a draft for an incentive known as the Product Environmental Footprint, or PEF. On the surface, PEF seems like a good incentive aiming to label consumer products according to their environmental footprint, thereby helping consumers make greener choices. Only in an effort to make their system simplified and universal across different industries rather than specific to each industry, the PEF guideline seems to have forgotten several key factors as to whether a product harms the environment or not. A lot of this is explained by a lack of internationally acceptable standards of measurement for a specific marker, which does leave us in somewhat of a bind when a method is presented to the public as holistic and standardized, but has holes that can be misused by, say, profit-minded members of industry with a reputation for heavy-handed lobbying and greenwashing. We do get some important parameters for environmental harm, such as climate change, ozone depletion, ecotoxicity, acidification, eutrophication and resource depletion, but nothing on other essential factors such as recyclability, chemicals leaching during use, microplastics, the full cost of fossil fuels, social impact, transparency or durability. A suggestion for updates and a more detailed how-to to the original 2013 PEF method was issued in 2019 and will be my primary reference for this discussion, but there are still several key factors causing problems. For instance, they still use a life cycle assessment or an assessment aiming to map out the impact of a product over its entire lifetime based on the cradle to grave standard, meaning a linear system from resource to landfill instead of the more progressive cradle to cradle standard, which seeks to achieve a more circular framework where a product is turned into new raw materials at the end of its lifespan, meaning it must be possible to dismantle it into its individual components. The latter would, in my opinion, be more in line with the EU's own stated goal of moving towards a more circular economy and could be incentivized by more severely penalizing production flows that rely on landfill and incineration as their primary or one of their primary end-of-life stages rather than reuse, recycling, composting, dismantling or any other more circular economy-friendly alternatives. Another factor I wish there was more of is incentives to producers to extend the use stage. Things like availability of parts and repairability and easily accessible care and maintenance guides. This could all be ways for a producer to gain more sustainability points that also benefits the consumer. Oh, and kicked out planned obsolescence while you're at it, yeah? Not sponsored. But a good example of this, in my opinion, is Ortlieb, a German producer of bike panniers. Not only do they come with a five-year waterproof warranty, but they also guarantee availability of parts for their panniers for 10 years after a product line has been discontinued. 
but we are not just talking about longevity of products here. I find it concerning that the section on animal husbandry takes only the energy of products like wool, meat and milk into account when providing calculations. There is no addendum about use percentages, economic value or what to do if any of the factors is underutilized. Farmers, after all, keep sheep because they could make a living doing so. In our modern society, that living is primarily achieved through the selling of meat. But historically, wool was the more valuable product of the sheep, so most of our current breeds have been bred to the point where they have to be shorn each year for animal welfare. Yet the cost of shearing and packing is often higher than what the farmer gets paid for the wool if they get paid at all, resulting in a significant portion of the wool getting discarded, composted or burned at the onset because it just isn't worth the effort. Which as a lover of all things wool and a professional waste reduction enthusiast is just an unimaginable tragedy. Not only does the PEF method tax wool and other animal fibers in exaggeration compared to their current economic value, it also completely ignores the wastefulness of a valuable resource that is currently being underutilized. Perhaps this is overly idealistic of me, but wouldn't it be nice if the PEF method included some factors which incentivize farmers and different manufacturers to collaborate so that farmers don't have to discard a lot of wool? or perhaps give wool and other underutilized input streams some extra sustainability until such a time comes when we utilize them more fully. Better use of our own resources decreases the need for external inputs and that sounds like circular economy thinking to me. This is similar to the multiplication factors used in recycled input streams later in the PEF method depending on whether a recycled resource is in demand or not. So the math is already there! Not only that, but when we get to the fossil fuel section of the PEF method, it is specified that calculations start from the point of use, such as combustion, digestion or transformation. The energy required to extract and form fossil fuels is not included for some reason. Giving any production method that utilizes fossil fuels in their production, such as synthetic fibers, an unfair advantage over agriculture, which is counted from the moment the first seed is planted and all through fertilizer, tractor and harvester use, which is assumed to be fossil fuel based by default. So perhaps include more of the fossil fuel life cycle, cost and emissions? At least the drilling and exploration part? Although formation of fossil fuels would make sense too, since that is what we do for any impact of agricultural origin. Please? Industry and life cycle assessment experts were then supposed to take this detailed but skewed PEF method and create product environmental footprint category rules to simplify and streamline the whole process for each industry and also make it possible to make comparisons between them. A draft for one such set of category rules was released in July 2021 for the garment and footwear section. And while I might have spent more time dissecting that, I shall not. Firstly, because it is very clearly a draft, with several sections missing or mar marked to be filled in at a later stage. But secondly, because all these industry-specific category rules are based on the current PATH method and checked for compliance. So any issue one might have with how the method is applied to any specific industry must be taken all the way back to the original methodology it was based on. Instead, I will talk a little about why synthetic fibers specifically are a challenge and why textiles in general are hard to recycle. Many of you environmentally minded folks will probably have heard about microfibers and microplastics or small bits of synthetic fibers aka plastic detaching from synthetic garments and all other plastics, especially during washing and then getting carried away off into the waterways and nature. 
This causes challenges such as wildlife mistaking microfibers for food but receiving no nutritional benefit from them, leading some to die of starvation but with a full belly. And yet, plastic pollution is not just about the small plastic particles dispersed in nature and interfering with food chains. It is also about the chemicals that were used in their production, leaching into the environment and potentially causing harmful effects to, for instance, sensitive hormone systems. Something I could speak a lot more about, but we are trying to keep this brief, so on to recycling and waste management. For textiles, Direct recycling has a limited lifespan because old clothes spun into new thread and cloth will have shorter fibers each time, leading to lower quality. This is true whether a garment is synthetic or natural, and the same dead-end downcycling spiral is still true when used plastic bottles are recycled into new yarn and clothes. But where most synth synthetic materials eventually end up in the landfill and getting incinerated, Natural fibers have the potential of getting composted, unless they have been treated with too many chemicals in the meantime, such as the superwash treatment for wool, effectively coating each wool fiber in a thin layer of plastic, a process which is typically labeled on yarn, but for some reason not on garments. Meaning that natural fibers can be part of a cycle that grows new feed and fertilizer into new wool and plant fibers on the other end. On the end-of-life and recycling side, a whopping 30% of garment waste is assumed to end up being incinerated and another 34% just goes straight to landfill. That means the norm is that two out of three garments on average are never recycled or reused after we discard them. Recycling is very much not a solution in and of itself, especially if a product has a very short lifespan and is made up of multiple different types of material, including different types of fiber. The latter of which is generally a good indicator that it will be very difficult to recycle and reuse. All this to say that one of the most important things we can do as consumers is to try to hold on to our clothes for longer, repairing them if and when we can, and reducing how much new stuff we bring into our lives. I guess one of my biggest surprises in deep diving into this topic was the seemingly forced neutrality, if not just flat out screwing the math in favor of fossil fuel in the PETH method itself from the EU's standpoint. We know that we need to limit our dependencies on fossil fuels, not just because it is a prime driver for greenhouse gases and climate change, but also because it's getting harder and harder to acquire. Shouldn't the PEF method be the ideal place, not just to assess, but also to incentivize the behavior we want and penalize the behavior we do not? Is this not supposed to be a reflection of the environmental footprint? For instance, if the right to repair is a stated goal and promoted sustainability suggestion of the European Parliament, the PEF methodology and intended labeling system seems like the ideal place to include something like that. No? I know several hiking gear manufacturers in Norway who now offer repairs on their goods by brand professional. But positive incentives like these are not getting picked up by the PEF method in its current form. Longer warranties, or any warranties in some cases, access to spare parts, dedicated repair centers, and information about how to do easy repairs by the user themselves are just some of many positive incentives that would prolong the lifetime of a product and reduce overall demand. There is also no penalty for refusing to disclose factory locations or working conditions of the humans who make the products we buy, which is a level of transparency that fashion activists have been demanding for years. Do the workers earn a living wage in their countries? Does their health suffer from poor working conditions? The PEF methodology demands none of this information. Similarly, no details are required about what the producer does with unsold and returned goods. The dead stock or unsold stock of a product does not get included at the product level, but is captured instead on in the company's organizational environmental footprint, which can be added to the report if the company is actively trying to reduce dead stock. 
This seems reasonable at a surface level, but considering how specifically the electricity and packaging must be related to each individual product, I think it would make sense for companies to have to include their regional or company-wide dead stock averages into each product as well. But considering that this is data a lot of manufacturers would rather not disclose, it is easy to understand that things like this would get delayed when it is not specifically required. So, the intent of the PEF method seems good. Unless, perhaps, you take into account the highly problematic origin of a close namesake, the carbon footprint, and its history as a PR campaign launched by British Petroleum in order to distract consumers from big oil's responsibility when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions and climate change by putting the focus onto individual consumers instead. It may not be the PEF method's origin, but I do see a lot of potential for greenwashing and misleading information if the method is not amended and more stringent factors applied. Also, a big but very important caveat is that this is not a video saying that if you, as a consumer and creative, are buying or sewing with synthetic materials and fast fashion, you are a bad person. Far, far from it. We know that a lot of people have to rely on fast fashion in order to stay clothed. But I do think that a governmental body creating a system with the potential of impacting a multitude of industries across a whole continent and beyond maybe, just maybe, carries a slightly higher responsibility on their shoulder than the individual consumer. Don't you? I also wish to mention the organization Make the Label Count, which is running a campaign addressing this very issue. We are not affiliated, but if you want to check out their work, I will leave links to them in the resources of this video, which is already getting ridiculously long at this point. And thus concludes my brief, hopefully not too confusing, deep dive into some very long and rather technical documents. I hope you maybe got something useful out of it. Let me know if this type of technical deep dive is interesting, I certainly find it so. And all that is left to do is to wish you the best of luck if you are off to try to make sense of the myriad of different labeling and certifications out there. Until next time. Oh, and if this whole video hasn't already made my point abundantly clear, no, wool is not destroying the planet.